Again, we're going to be in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 8. And uh, this is Luke writing to Theophilus. Um, and, man, this, this letter, it is a, it is a narrative. It's, it's laying out uh, by story what happened, the story of the early church, the, the New Testament church. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, what happened and how the Spirit moved. This morning in Acts uh, chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 4. Verses 1 through 3 we covered in our devotion last week is Saul was ravaging the church as he was persecuting the church. We talked about in that devotion, I talked about persecution and how it does in fact what we're about to read. Now we're going to break today's text up in chapter 8. We're going to do the rest of chapter 8 and we're going to break it up really into... Uh, uh, one chunk in the beginning, and then two stories. So, start reading with me in chapter 4. You can follow along there in your Bible. There's Bibles in the, the seats under you. It's also on the screen. Thus says the Lord uh, through Luke, verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to that was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. Now, I have five points. From that little passage. And here's the first one. It's that the gospel will not be stopped by persecution. Persecution, in fact, does the opposite of stopping the gospel. It spreads the gospel. And Saul was persecuting the church after the stoning of Stephen. Doing so in order to oppress the people. To make them stop talking. To have them shut up. But the opposite happens. They were scattered about, and they didn't scatter about and be silent. They scattered about and preached the word. They did not shut up. The gospel will not be stopped by persecution. In fact, it mobilizes the gospel. The Lord, in his sovereign plan, uses it for his glory to the nations for the good of those nations. The second thing I want you to see here is that the gospel is proclaimed without prejudice. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. As soon as you read the word Samaria, it should jump off the page at you. And in your mind, the best place to go is back to John chapter 4. Jesus was in Samaria doing ministry once, and he told his disciples, hey, we're going on a journey. And they thought that journey would take a long time, because the, the way it worked in Jerusalem, when they would, when they would travel, they would, they would do their best to travel around Samaria, because they hated Samaritans. They, they, they called them all sorts of ugly names. The truth was, they were relatives, they were half-descendants, um, and so they, they had some of the same lineage, and they would, they would get called ugly names. And, and I'll say there's prejudice there. There was prejudice both ways, but from the Jews, it was ugly. They, they called them unclean. They called them dogs. They called them half-breeds. They would go to great lengths not to come in contact with Samari Samaritans. If you've ever read the story, The Good Samaritans, like the, the very title there, that the, the story of the Good Samaritan is, is shocking because to a Jewish person, there's no such thing as a good Samaritan. But yet Jesus takes his disciples and he goes th straight through Samaria and he has a divine appointment and encounter with a woman at the well. Now, if you recall that story, remember she, she had five husbands and the one she, wasn't, she was with then, wasn't, she wasn't married to. So she would have been like the most unclean of unclean things. And yet he meets her and she has faith and leads her to the Lord. And then they go into Sychar, a city in the area of Samaria, and many people come to faith. So Philip, as he goes there, he's not the first person 
He's not the first missionary. Jesus was. He's, he's doing follow-up work. Now, people go and they come to faith. But I want you to understand that when he leaves Jerusalem, he goes into a place that would have been hated by Jews. So the first place he goes, and then the next person he encounters, guess what, is an Ethiopian eunuch. The next person he's going to encounter in the next story is an Ethiopian eunuch. So Philip, a, prosel, a, a, a proselyte Gentile convert to Judaism, is going to proclaim the gospel without any prejudice. Here's the third thing I want you to see. is that they, they went and... Uh, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. They paid attention. The gospel demands our attention. The story of the good news of Jesus, that yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were undeserving of God's Mercy, Him not giving us the punishment we deserve and His grace, His unmerited favor, giving us the gifts of salvation which we did not deserve, could not buy or could not earn. That story demands our attention. And so when you hear it preached, listen. Now I'll tell you, there are people in the room who you've never believed the gospel. And, and, and you're here because your parents have made you or... You're coming with a family member, whatever that is. Let me just say, let it grab your attention this morning. I'll tell you what, most people in the room who, who have long walked with Jesus would, could look back and remember the moment in which God grabbed their attention. Maybe to a story they had heard multiple times, but for some reason, this one time when they heard it, God changed their heart. Maybe that's this morning for you. The gospel demands our attention. We should never get tired of hearing the good news of Jesus. Every time we read it in scripture, we hear it sung in song, we hear it preached, proclaimed, we ought to love it. It ought to demand our attention. The next thing I want to show you is that the gospel transforms lives. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And so the gospel changes lives. This was not new for us seeing this. We see Jesus do it um, in his ministry, that he didn't leave people as they were, that he changed them, that he would heal them from their earthly ailments, but he gave them more than that. He healed them from their spiritual darkness of heart. He would save them. The gospel, when we encounter Jesus, he doesn't leave us where we are. He doesn't leave us in our sin, but we are new creations in Christ. The old man gone, the new has come. God transforms us. And the fifth thing I would point out from this passage is that the gospel brings joy to the city. It's stated there in, in verse 8. It's, it's, um, there again we'll see it in scripture that people in Samaria, after they heard it, they were brought great joy. But we see it again in verse 39 with the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, after his encounter with, with Philip, after believing the gospel and being baptized, that he left rejoicing. Here's the truth. The gospel brings us joy. It might not make us happy all the time, but it brings us joy. I, I can testify to this in my life, and I can't always necessarily explain it. But I remember being an eighth grader, and, and it was... a, a you know, this time as an 8th grader, as a 14-year-old, I was laid up in a bed with a back brace on. My, my goals of playing high school football and basketball were gone. My days of, of riding and racing motorcycles out the window. And yet, I had joy. 17 years old, my, my father passes away with a brain aneurysm, and yet... I was able to find joy. And in, in my early 20s, I went through this, this season where my coworkers started calling me Murphy for Murphy's Law. Like, whatever could go wrong was going wrong. And yet, I had an unspeakable joy in my early 20s. And then I got married. And marriage is a ton of joy. But we lost children. And we had a hard time having babies. And sometimes that was very, very hard 
And yet the Lord gave me joy. Not where I was just consumed with the things on earth, but consumed with Jesus and his glory and who he is. And those moments, being able to find joy in who he is, not in my earthly circumstances. And here's this true. When the gospel is proclaimed and people believe it, it brings joy, not just to the individual, but to the city. And church history would show us that where the gospel is proclaimed, it is for the good of the city. It is for the joy of the city because God transforms lives. And he brings people joy. Now, we're going to hear more about Philip. This summarizes his ministry in those five things. But now we're going to hear about two conversions. I've never heard these, these two stories preached together. But I think that preached together, these two stories really have a lot for us. It holds a mirror up into us for us to look into that mirror. And to, to see which one are we like. So, verse 9 says this, There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. That's how you know if somebody's great, if they got to tell you how great they are. You, somebody had somebody come to mind, didn't you? Anyway, stop, repent of that, focus on Jesus. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. So here Simon is able to pull some real magic tricks, and he has a following. He, have, he has people who are following him, and they think that, hey, this guy is something special. But when they believe Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. The gospel is proclaimed People believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, and they're baptized. And here it says in verse 13, even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. And so, he, here he is, um, even, even as his, his followers are leaving, if you can't beat them, join them. So he starts following Philip there himself. Now remember last week, as persecution happened, as the scattering happened, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Uh, they, they weren't scared, they weren't run off. But as the gospel is taking root in Samaria, the Holy Spirit brings them there. So it says, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God... They sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, this is what I'm going to talk about this coming Wednesday in my devotion. I'm going to talk about when does the believer receive the Holy Spirit? And is this text in these few verses descriptive of what happens or prescriptive? I'm going to talk about is this normative or is this a special time? Is this what we see in all of Scripture? That's what I'm going to talk about. I want to be able to give this a fair handling because the truth is these verses bring out pretty big division in church history. So I want to, I want to be able to give these verses uh, a good handling. So I'm going to do that in my devotion on Wednesday. But Simon, verse 18, saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the, uh, the apostles' hands. He offered them money. So seeing that the apostles, uh, Peter and John, come down and they do this, he's like, I want that power. I want to be able to do that. So he tries to buy it. Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I uh, lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of the wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. 
For I see that you are in gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon's answer, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they were turning to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So, our first story of conversion is one of opportunity and power. You see, I think, I think Simon, he's losing his followers. And in verse 13, it makes it seem as if it's genuine, and he believes the gospel. He has this opportunity. As, it makes it seem like it, but as you read more, it seems as if he doesn't really believe but he wants opportunity and power. It's not about getting Jesus. It's about getting power. And so here's what he does. He's like, okay, I can't, can't beat him. I'm going to join him. He sees God work miracles. Can I buy that? To which Peter and John, uh, Peter just lays it out there. You've missed it, bro. You, you're, you're off here. You can't buy God. You can't earn your way. You can't work your way. You can't pay your way. You can't do it. What, what we have here is someone who saw an opportunity and jumped on it and tried to gain power. Man, I'll tell you what. I think we are suckers for opportunity. I know I am. You know, I, I can go to a store and I can need something, but like truly need it. And if it's not on sale, I won't buy it. The men in the room, y'all get this. But if you go... And it's a good deal. It's on sale. It's a good opportunity. You can't pass it up. It's not going to be on sale forever, right? Like we see opportunity. Um, Buddy and I pass these things back and forth. We're like, hey, Jax has a good, and REI has a good, and did you see what Shields is doing? They're priced. That's a great, you know. We, we do that. We like jump on opportunity. I, I remember um, I was in my early 20s, and this girl called me or texted me. Um, back on that old Nokia that had the snakes. You remember that game? Um, <laughs> that was a good game. Uh, she texted me. I, ha- I hadn't seen her since like early high school. She moved away and she had moved back to town. She was like, hey, I'd like to connect. And I was like, me too, single. And uh, she was like, let's meet at Wendy's. And I was like, red flag. <laughs> Wendy's? Anyway, we meet at Wendy's and we sit down and we talk and she gives me this, uh, oh, it's so great to reconnect. Hey, I've got, a, I've got an opportunity for you. Y'all know it was coming, right? Amway. Like, just like that. I don't know. I don't remember which one it was, but it was one of those kind of pyramid things, you know, like, all right, you've got to start your, uh, uh, uh. How many of y'all bid on that opportunity? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't, don't raise your hand. We, don't, uh, we do that, though. We jump on opportunity. We think there is a way for opportunity, for power, for money, to gain worldly possessions, to gain those things. We do it. So we're suckers for opportunity, but we also fall prey to power. And, and I would tell you this, that um, especially those who have tasted it, who have been in leadership often begin to abuse that leadership and that power because they'll do anything they can to keep it. Who's worked for that guy? Some of you work for that guy. This is what we do. We, 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 we are suckers for opportunity. We fall prey to power. I think we can look at Simon and we can see how in, in his way of losing power, this was an opportunity to regain power. I think because we are this way and we're built this way, this is one of the, the prideful things that, that we are fallen to, that it makes the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel a re- really easy sell. And so, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this gospel, but there's guys out there. Maybe it's a, a Benny Hinn who's a faith healer or a, a Creflo Dollar who will take your money and help you multiply it. Maybe um, you're, you're not that charismatic and you need a little better smile with it. So maybe it's a Joel Olstein, And it's this health, wealth, prosperity teacher that would say, if you come to Jesus, you'll get this. If you just have enough faith, you'll get this. If you are obedient and you have faith and you give this thousand dollar seed offering, God will do this. And so I think it makes suckers 
for that opportunity. I had a friend one time who, uh, man, we were reading and, and praying and studying the Bible together, and he comes to comes to work one day, and we meet at lunchtime to, to have a conversation. He's hanging his head low, and I'm like, what's wrong? He goes, man, you know, I've got this going through this hard thing, and I was watching TV the other night, flipping channels, and I hit TBN, and there's some evangelist, and they're offering a prayer rug, and if I just send them thirty nine ninety nine, they'll send me a prayer rug and some uh, oil, and I can anoint it, and my problem will go away, and I did it. And I said, let me see the prayer rug. He pulls out 11 by 7, whatever, standard sheet of paper with a rug printed on it and this little bitty thing of oil that looks like you'd oil your beard trimmer with. <laughs> it's like, dude, you've been had. You're a had before you even entered the credit card info. We're suckers for it. And I think for us, um, maybe there's this new health, wealth, prosperity gospel that has a little tighter jeans on and a little cooler haircut with a nice line in it and a, and a smile and, and a message that's a little different. It's not, hey, I'll give you these things. It's that you can overcome. It's that, hey, millennial, your life is hard. I know you've got lots of challenges, but if you just grind at it and put hard work in, you can do it. Just with a little faith. Take David, for instance, and then they'll... they'll what we call eisegesis, they'll read themselves into the Bible as if they're an Old Testament character, and then they'll promise you if you just have enough faith that God will fix X. Well, here's the problem with that. Simon's conversion was more than likely a false conversion. I'll be shocked if I get to heaven and Simon is there. Church historians uh, say that a lot, some attribute that Gnosticism, one of the main uh, uh, opponents of the gospel, was born out of Simon the magician. And so his conversion was more than likely one of false conversion. It was coming to Jesus to gain something. Now, I want to be clear here. I came to Jesus and I gained a lot. I gained more than something. Like I could look at my life and you could, you could look at some of the things I have in my life, my health, my wealth. You could say I'm prosperous. You could point to these things. And I would look at them and say every good thing that I have came from Jesus. But here's what I want to tell you. If that you take every good thing I have away, Jesus is still good. Listen. Jesus is not the means to something. Jesus is the great someone. He's not the mean to some ends. He is the end. Jesus is the end. He's the goal. Oh, that we would glorify God and we would proclaim Jesus Christ. And here's our second, our second tale, our second conversion story, Acts Chapter 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, if you're looking on a map and here's Jerusalem and up here is the, the region of Samaria and then the city of Samaria, uh, the Lord would have just, like, res he, he came from Jerusalem, he went there, would reverse course and head him south to the road that leads to Gaza. Now, we're going to deal with the Ethiopian Unit. Ethiopia in the time was, doesn't have the same geographical borders exactly, but think Northeast Africa. And so he's heading to Northeast Africa where there are uh, the, the, the country of Ethiopia. Now, um, this is a desert place, and he rose and he went, and there was an Ethiopian, a unit, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was spreading, uh, or he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, 
And like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? So, for his life is taken away from the earth. This is Isaiah 53. This is what Dave read. Uh, this is what, what Dave would tell you is the fifth gospel. It's, it's pointing to Jesus. This is, this is the, the, probably one of the more clear readings of the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I asked, does this prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. You know what the good news about Jesus is? We call that the gospel. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down in the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Simon's conversion story is one of opportunity and power. The Ethiopian eunuch's story is one of humility and opportunity. You see, searching for the truth led the Holy Spirit to finding him. You know, he's, he's at this point kind of like the chief financial officer of Ethiopia. He's the, the minister of finances, if, if you will, for Ethiopia. He's somewhat privileged, though a servant. His position of eunuch ma made him one of in, in like a lifetime of indebtedness and service to his, the, the queen, Candace. But yet, he would have had wealth at his fingertips. He would have been taken care of. The fact that he has a scroll, the fact that he has a manuscript of Isaiah 53 was great mercy. There probably weren't many Ethiopians, if any, who had that copy. And so here the Lord is obviously doing a work. He's caused him to seek him and he sought him out. A proselyzed Judaizer, a proselyzed um, Jewish person coming to try to find God. And yet God in his providence by divine appointment finds him. He sought him as a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He intercepted him. He saved him. And so searching for truth led the Holy Spirit to find him. And so look at the difference in the story when Philip approaches, his, approaches him. Philip asks him a question, and he invites him up, and then he starts asking questions. He, he didn't come saying, oh, I, I can read, and I can perceive, and I can understand. He comes to the, how can I, I know, how can I know, if no, how can I know this if no one teaches me? Jennifer and I do a good bit of, of counseling, um, all sorts of counseling, premarital counseling, mar marital counseling, just just counseling in general. And, and when we do that, it's very, very rare that even though someone is looking for counseling, they're coming in a place of humility. Meaning, they come, they, they say their, their problem or what their trial is, we get a few words out of our mouth, and then the reply that you often get in this place is, I know, I know, I know, I know, but, and they just spill. And you kind of sit there and wonder, like, why am I here? If you've really got all this figured out already, and you say you want help, but you're coming from a place of pride, and you won't put it down and listen, you won't, you won't like, listen to what the Word of God says, you just throw a bunch of, here's my circumstances, they're so bad without listening, like, that's, that's how we often try to come to Christ, is a prideful place. This, this is not... What the Ethiopian unit did. He comes in humility. Here he is, a court official. 
of, of uh, a country and a place where he has great things to be prideful of, but yet invites him up and listens to Philip. And so Philip proclaims the gospel. He shows him. He ties together the Old Testament the New Testament and proclaims Christ. And the Ethiopian eunuch believes the gospel and is saved. And he looks up and he says, there's water. What keeps me from being baptized? Here's what I would tell you. Is that just in that moment that you sh- he, he, he was obedient. Never miss an opportunity to obey Jesus. Never miss an opportunity. De- de- baptism is simply a picture. Um, it's a command in scripture. It's our first steps as believers in proclaiming to the world that we have been Baptized. I mean, that we have followed Jesus, and that is we baptized. Uh, the, the water paints a picture of a grave, and is that we are lowered into that grave. It's if we've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer we who live, but it's Christ who lives in us. So we say we're dead to our trespasses and sins. That's going into the tomb, and we're raised up to walk in a newness of life. That's what we say. So that, that our baptism is showing that we are following Christ. That the old is gone, that the new has come, that we've been transformed. And here the opportunity was put before Philip. And humbly making Jesus Lord of his life, he follows in baptism. Now Simon was baptized too. Both had opportunity, it's what they did with it. One who approached it seeking power. One who approached it seeking Jesus. One who approached it wanting to be Lord. One who approached it making Jesus Lord. Now, I think there's a couple different scenarios that as we read these two conversion stories that we fall into. Now, the first one, there's, there's four that I see. The first one is that you've never made a profession of faith. You've, you don't claim to be converted. You're here today because you're, 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 you're fam- you came with your family or... Uh, you're, you're young, or you're seeking the Lord, maybe that the Lord is drawing you, just as the Lord put it in the Ethiopian eunuch's heart. He's put this spiritual curiosity in you. And so today, this is what I would tell you, if you've not believed the gospel, just as God used Philip and sent him to this divine appointment to save the Ethiopian eunuch, this could be your divine moment where the Lord has brought you here today so that you could hear the good news that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. That while you have hatred in your heart towards God and man, God loves you anyway. And he wants to bring you into his fold. That's the gospel, that's good news. The second would be this, that you're like Simon, that at some point you had a conversion experience, but you were sold the wrong goods. You tried to buy power. You thought by being baptized that it would either get you a get out of hell free card or make your parents happy, or this was just the thing to do to be saved. And so you did it, maybe at a young age, not knowing and not making Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Maybe you're like Simon. The third place is that I think you could be like the Ethiopian eunuch. That you, you humbly saw the opportunity to follow Jesus and you followed Jesus. You made him Lord of your life and you were baptized and it is in the right order. But I think the fourth could be this. Is that you, at a, you, you made a profession of faith, but it was a false profession of faith. You weren't converted. Maybe you were young and you saw other kids doing it and you did it. But yet, at an older age, you believed the gospel and were saved. But yet, because of embarrassment or something like that, that you've not owned it to this moment. And baptism is very clear in scripture that it is, it is by immersion, it is after faith, not before. Maybe your parents baptized you as, as an infant. And I would say to that, that your parents started a good work in you, that with good intentions... They did that, painting a picture of what it would be like. But now, Scripture is very clear that it is for the believer. And so, if you've believed the gospel, you should be baptized. And so, I would tell you this. 
Never miss an opportunity to obey Jesus. You will not regret it. You'll not regret giving your life to the Lord. You'll not regret following Jesus. I've never followed Jesus and been obedient to him and looked back and regretted it. Not one time. The opposite is true. There's been times where I, I, I failed to be obedient and did regret it. Here's the last thing I want to say. This is my last point. Where the Holy Spirit leads, we must faithfully go. Now, uh, to, 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 to man's mind, as we think about things, this might not have made sense. You see, here Philip was in Samaria, proclaiming Christ, and people were believing and being baptized like crazy. People were coming. He's all of a sudden in the limelight. Everybody's knowing his name. Philip, the proclaimer of Christ. But yet God takes him and he pulls him and he sends him way to the south to meet with one person. We can't know what God is doing. God is doing a million things at once and we're often only aware of a few of them. And so this is what's true. Wherever God calls us to we must faithfully go. Sometimes to the world, it will not make sense. But we must do it anyway. Now, I'm not saying like, I'm not saying, okay, um, you're not like Jonah and God's call on Jonah, but Jonah to go to Nineveh. And that because you've got a, a prejudice or hate in your heart, that you need to repent of that and go there. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we just need to be obedient and follow Jesus, period. We need to obey, we never need to miss the opportunity to be led by the Spirit, to proclaim the gospel. Maybe it's to your neighbor, maybe it's to a coworker, maybe it's to a friend, a family member, a person on, on the bus or in the seat next to you on the airplane, that you would be open to what the Spirit is doing, that you would not be disobedient to that. Now, here's what I think is true. Most of the time, for us, our disobedience is more distraction. Let me give an example. This past weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the boys and I went to, down to Buena Vista and rode motorcycles with some other folks from church and camped. And on the way home last night, John Owen says, I'm going to in, go inside, I'm going to hug Mama, tell her hello, and I'm going to get in the shower because I'm filthy and I want to be clean. And he was. We all were. You're really dirty. That's what happens when you ride motorcycles for 30 days. You're dirty. He comes in. His eyes, I'm watching him. His eyes lock on mom. He says, hey, mom. And the TV's on. And it's a, a show that he loves. And his eyes catch it. And next thing you know, he's on the couch. In the chair. Two hours later, I've called him, made him do some things that help clean. But he just keeps getting sucked back to the chair. James. We did the whole, like, pick a number, what number you are, James won, James decided he wanted to take a shower first, James goes and takes a shower, I'm outside working, Jennifer has to run to the store, I come back in, it's 8.05, I'm filthy, I'm tired, I'm ready for a shower. And I look, and I said, hey, have you boys both had your showers? And John Owen goes, I gritted my teeth, I was furious, I told him to go take a shower. And I wanted him to, and he didn't. I was furious. I was mad. I hate it when, as a parent, my sin all of a sudden gets greater than their sin. Anyway, I grounded him from the TV until. I just said, you're grounded from TV until. Like, there's no, like, not a week, but, like, until. Maybe until Jesus comes back, you're grounded from the TV. I don't know, but until I get over this, you're grounded. And he goes upstairs, and he takes a shower. This morning... Uh, he and I have a talk about it. And I said, son, last night when you were disobedient, were you, you disobedient because you didn't care what dad said and you thought, I know better than dad and I don't need a shower? Or were you disobedient because you were distracted? And ultimately, guess what? It wasn't because he had this heart that said, I know better than my dad. It wasn't this heart that said, I, I just want to disobey dad. It doesn't matter what dad says. Ultimately, the reason he didn't is because the show that was on TV 
was really good. And he was distracted. And I think this is true for Christians. I think this is true for us as we seek to proclaim Christ. It's not necessarily out of this willful place in our heart that we just don't want to do what Jesus says. is that we're distracted by the things of the world. That we're looking at the things of the world and they have our attention. And we need to repent and we need to take our eyes off the things of the world and we need to put our eyes on Jesus. Where the Holy Spirit we leads, we must faithfully go. And as a church, we must never miss an opportunity to obey Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You're good. And your steadfast love endures forever. Even though we don't deserve it. Even though there's no way we can earn it. Even though there's nothing we can do to buy favor with you. Even while we are wretched in our hearts and we're far from you. That Lord, in your goodness, God the Father sends his son to the earth to suffer and bleed and die for us. God, you're good. Lord, today I pray that you would move and work in our hearts. That our, our stories of conversion would not be like Simon, but it would come from a place of humility and the truth that we get the opportunity to follow you. Let us follow you in spirit and truth.